Welcome everyone to another webinar. Hope you're doing well. Excited to get started here with you. Not sure if you're have another week or so of your season left or if you've already finished, but whatever the case, I'm glad you're here. So let's talk dry land and specifically the essentials of dry land. We'll be kind of going through a couple of webinars in a row here over the summer. And I thought it would be cool to end up the webinar on kind of a summary of what we've been working through the last three webinars. So first off, make sure you introduce yourself. Thank you for taking the time, especially those of you that are joining us live. Put your name in the chat, where you're from. I always love seeing where everyone is joining us from. And then we're also going to launch our first poll here. I always like to know who is in the audience. And I know some of you are a swimmer and a coach or a swimmer and a parent. Think of the one thing that you're looking for from a dry land lens perspective. So a lot of coaches here. All right, coaches, hope, hopefully you're getting some rest. Get through that championship gauntlet there out in the heat. Hope you're doing well. Lots of coaches here. Awesome, guys. All right. Thanks, everyone, for participating in that. It's always good to see where people are joining us from. And then let's see. I want to know too if this is your first webinar. We'll have a QA at the end. But for those of you that don't know me, oh, pretty 50 50 so far. Awesome. Well, welcome. A lot of new people then. I'm Chris Ritter, was a longtime swimmer, swim coach, strength coach for a long time, started rear sports performance. And then a few years ago, we created Surge Strength, specifically the Surge Strength Dryland certification and the Dryland programs that we do. All right, good bit of new people here today. That's awesome. I always love seeing that. And then the last poll before we get started here is, are you in the academy? Because it's free. So if not, I'm not sure why not. Free one-on-one -on -one courses for parents, swimmers, coaches. All right, a lot of you already have. Good, good. Hope you're enjoying it. We're continuing to work on what we're adding to it all the time. Awesome. Thanks for your participation, guys. All right. So I'm just going to change my screen. Just give me one second here while I... Hit the wrong button. All right. So in addition to webinars, we do podcasts, blogs, YouTube channel. So lots of stuff out there that we're putting out for dry land and obviously a lot of swim swim articles as well. And guys, we're we're onboarding a ton of people right now. Teams, I just had to hire a bunch of dry land certified coaches to keep up with demand. So it's awesome. All the teams and individuals that we're helping with world all around. I mean, I just had a call from uh, Malaysia the other day <laughs> on boarding a swimmer, so it's pretty awesome. But let's get into today's topic, dry land essentials. And I wanted to think about what are the core components. If I only wanted to teach you just a few things about dry land, what would they be? So especially those of you that are live, Put those distractions on silent, whatever you need to do. Let's jump into here. I got a bunch of stuff I want to cover as usual. So if I could split up into three buckets of you have to make sure you're checking this box when it comes to your dry land training, this is how I would approach it. Core strength, number one, shoulder mobility, or even shoulder health. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit too. And then pull up strength as well. So let's jump in to core strength and what that looks like. But first off too, I want to set the stage just a little bit more. This is very similar to if you guys are already enrolled to become SSDC or been on a couple of other webinars too. You've probably seen this slide. It's a pretty central part of how we think about dry land training at Surge Strength is these three things, elements to build a swimmer's body. So high strength to mass ratio. So pull-ups is a great exercise that, exhibit, that exhibits that in terms of how strong is a swimmer relative to their weight. And then having a strong core, being able to slice through that water, and then mobility, obviously in the shoulder, such a critical part in all the strokes, making sure you have a great catch position. And when I boil down 
what we want to have in the water transfer over from dry land, it really comes down to, can the swimmer get in a better position and can they hold tension longer or at a higher rate or a combination of such? And that's where you get into more event specific training, if you will. But let's jump into more core strength and what that looks like and how to really build that in your athletes. I know we have a lot of coaches here. So coaches, I'm sure you have some athletes that probably look like that top picture or even worse, and that's okay. But you want to make sure that these athletes that are struggling with even a basic concept like this bridge, that you know how to chunk it down and even have other exercises that are going to help build up their strength. So eventually they can look more like that middle and bottom picture in terms of what their brace and core looks like when they're actually doing exercises. This is a great visual that you should share with your swimmers too, is the idea in core training is we want to move you closer from that raft body position in the water, being kind of being jiggly, able to move around, not a lot of tension and tautness in the middle to more of that kayak. It's solid. It's just going to slice through the water. And even just thinking about, are you engaging your core or not can make a big difference in that. So at surge strength, we divide up exercises or movements into five categories. And for core training, quote unquote, we term that bracing because that's really at the end of the day, what we want for swimmers to get out of their core training is how to brace better to slice through that water. So let's look at how to actually do that here. And it centers around the front bridge and the progressions that we're gonna go through. And all these exercises too, I'm gonna to show you are on our YouTube channel, Surge Strength. So feel free if you haven't already subscribed and then look through those exercises as well. And we update videos uh, on that channel pretty regularly. But this is the main exercise we wanna build up a swimmer's competency in. But like I showed you a few slides ago, some of you may not have a great looking technique like this. So you have to chunk down the intensity of what you're asking your swimmers to do. And yes, this video is still going. It's not a still picture, right? So this is the ideal in terms of head, shoulders, hips. They're all in alignment. It doesn't even look like it's a live video, but the swimmer and athlete are able to hold that position. Now, again, for your weaker swimmers, you're going to need to chunk that down. So how you can individualized training, especially in a group setting, would be to have everyone do a front bridge, and then you could break up the group into even three different sections if you needed to. So the weakest athletes, they could be doing 10 seconds up and then rest for 30 seconds. So that way the 10 seconds, they can make it as good as possible and making sure every time they're in that up position, they have the best technique they can. Then maybe your other group that's a little bit stronger, but still needs some room for growth. They could go 20 seconds on and 10 seconds off. So if you notice in that, we flipped the ratio of work to rest there. So it's a little a double in terms of the work to rest, but they're still not having to hold it for that long. 20 seconds is still relatively small on that scale. And then for your really advanced athletes, you could flip the ratio even more when it comes to work rest, have them up for 50 seconds and then resting for only 10 seconds. That's a big jump from that. But you can play around with those combinations. And that's just one example of how you can take an exercise that some of your swimmers may really struggle with and others maybe are pretty advanced and still have everyone doing relatively the same exercise in terms of an administrative way of how you coaches have to run your drowning. But it allows the athletes to have individual um, goals in terms of, all right, I want to try to get this 10 seconds as best as I can. And other swimmers are focusing on that 50 seconds as best as they can. The other thing to remember too, whenever you're building up brace capacity and strength is frequency is so important. It's much more important that you hit the frequency as often as possible, even if it's a five, 10 minute session. I would gladly have one session every day for five to 10 minutes, then one or two 30 or 40 minute sessions in a week. So even having your team do this right before they jump in the water, or maybe it's just a quick dry land when they get out of the water, whatever your schedule may be, find a way to build in more frequency when you're doing brace training. It's really going to help your swimmers. But now I want to show you a couple other exercises, especially for more on the beginner end 
for your athletes that you can help with or do yourself if you're still trying to build up your bracing capability as well. So the first one is stir the pot, very similar position, right? But now it's a little bit more difficult because, because we have the instability of the ball here, but you can see relatively the position is the same, head, shoulders, hips, all in line there. And then just slowly moving the ball clockwise in one direction for whatever set of reps you're doing. And then the other. In the rest position, you just simply drop the knees down. But you can see here how we're teaching the athletes to keep tightness. And that, that's what you should be coaching too. Make sure you're staying tight while you have some movement because that's eventually what we want them to do when we're actually in the water. So kneeling rollout, it's a little bit more intense than the stir of the pot, but still even beginners can get some competency at this exercise. The other way you can adjust this kneeling rollout is they have bigger wheels than this too. So the bigger the implement that you're rolling out with, the easier it's going to be. So this is actually the hardest version with this small wheel. You can get a bigger wheel or you can even use your arms on a stability ball that we just saw in the previous exercise. So right there, three different versions of one exercise based on whatever your ability is. But you're trying to keep that line, and especially this reach out part, that's where you're getting your money out of this exercise. Another one in that bridge position is the bridge drag with sandbag. And if you haven't tried sandbags, these are a great tool, especially if you don't have a lot of space for storage of weights and things like that. They, they're they pretty durable and it, the cost is so much less than other weights in terms of you just got to go down to your uh, home improvement store, buy some sand and then fill it up. And then you can also have adjustableness in it too, in terms of taking out sand, putting it back in. But this is a great exercise for building up a swimmer's brace capability. You want to have as little movement as possible. A little bit is okay. I mean, you're not going to be perfectly still, but you still want a solid line, head, shoulders, hips, all the way through that as you're moving the sandbag back and forth. Now, increasing it a little bit more, now we're having the legs off the ground in a TRX or other type of suspension system, and we're still holding that bridge line, but now you're seeing how far back you can go. And your money on this exercise is really how far back can you go right here? So the forward is, is not as important. It's really how far can you reach back and make sure your hips aren't dropping down, make sure they're staying up. So head, shoulders, hips are all in line there. And then another one, this is not so much like hard to do, but you have to have some competency in your core to start to be able to almost work this exercise. So it doesn't look the hardest necessarily, but you do need to make sure your athletes probably at least can do that front bridge for like 20 seconds on. This would be a harder exercise for even the ones that are only able to do 10 seconds. But what the idea is, you want to create tension in almost like this upside down banana here so that there's tension from your chest all the way through your hips, even into your quads and hamstrings a little bit. And so there's a little bit on the ground from like hips to shoulders or right under your shoulders is the only thing on the ground. Doesn't look like a lot, but this is a great teaching exercise. Again, not for absolute beginners, but once you start to get a feel of how to engage your core and especially being able to breathe while you have engagement, this is a great exercise to help continue that learning process. So the whole idea is we're moving as much as we can away from the rubber raft body into the kayak body to slice through the water. And that occurs on land doing those exercises. But then also once the athletes are in the water, reminding them, cueing them up of, hey, remember how you're tightening up when you're holding that front bridge at the very end. That's what you want to be like when you're going on these repeat 50s or whatever you're doing in the water. That can really be where you're transferring what you're doing on land into the water, but you have to have the athletes be able to feel that. And those are some great exercises to help them figure out that bracing capability for them. So now let's shift to shoulder healthier. And so this is two prong. This is a mobility issue, but also a strength issue with shoulders. So let's think about how that works. And obviously with the shoulders, your catch position, right? This is a funky position. It's hard for me to even get into this position as I'm just standing here. And so if you have a lot of tightness in your shoulder or not the greatest mobility, now you're really behind the eight ball trying to get into an early vertical form position, which most of the strokes are requiring for you to be able to maximize your pull. 
The other thing you have going against you, especially as a coach, you know, this is swimming is so repetitive that the shoulder is taking a lot of the brunt for this. We call this the math of swimming or kind of the internal struggle of the swimmer. And so you can see really quickly in not a short time or not a long period of time of training, there's a large number of just volume of strokes that an athlete's shoulder is going through. And what happens if you have nothing to counteract that? And so that's where I really recommend you have a two-pronged approach. One, to make sure you're maintaining shoulder mobility through that volume, but also increasing shoulder strength as well. And sometimes coaches and athletes, you know, they say, hey, I don't want to touch the shoulders. Let's not do any exercise and just hope everything's okay. That's a disastrous approach because we already see the volume is going to come. So you need to have a plan of how to counteract that for the betterment of your swimmers. And this is not how to improve shoulder mobility, by the way. Here's your cheat uh, on the test here, which will be later. <laughs> so there's a lot of mobility exercise that we have on our YouTube channel. I want to go over a couple of my favorites, and they're in this Eldoa series here, this A, B, and T Eldoa stretches. These can be pretty intense, but you want to make sure we follow our rules about stretching, and that's making sure we're breathing and we're smiling the whole time. So this Eldoa A, you're sitting with knees bent, so in this A position here, trying to have your back as tall as possible, tall spine, so not slouched at all. Then what you're going to do is put your hands out and you kind of going to do the Spider-Man effect. So flip your wrists, call this external rotation, and you're trying to get as much external rotation as possible. So the more you can twist that thumb out to the side, the better. This is all while you're keeping spine straight, right? Breathing, smiling. Now you raise the arms up and you're just seeing how tall can you get in your spine, reach the palms to the sky, sit up as tall as possible, breathing and smiling. Again, some of this, your athletes, if they have really tight shoulders, this is going to be pretty intense just getting into this. So you want to make sure too, that when you're done, you unwind slowly because you're creating a lot of tension in a stretch like this. So as long as you're remembering our rules of breathing and smiling, and you're coming out of it very slowly, that's going to be fine. Don't have to worry about any negative consequence on that. Now, the Eldoa B one, slight variation. So now you're going to be on your back, knees at a 90 degree position, and then you're actually bringing your knees closer. So you have pretty tight angle at your hip. Now, instead of your palms turning out, you're turning out your feet. So external rotation of your lower feet here and turning the pinky toes out as much as possible. Then we're still thinking long, tall spine. Now we go back to the Spider-Man arms, turning them out, palm as flat as possible, turn the thumbs out as much as possible. And now you're holding this position. And sometimes if you need to put like a little towel or something behind your neck too, that, that can be helpful as well. But you're thinking, turn out the toes, turn out the hands, and then slowly unwind as well. Now, the last one in this series, Eldoa T, it builds on top of B. So you're going to get in that B position, same rules apply, turning the toes out, turning your external rotation in terms of your arms, turn those thumbs out as far as possible. And again, you can it, take your time to get into this. It's okay. Make sure you're breathing, smiling the whole time too. Now, once we get to this position where we ended B, we're going to go one arm out to the side one at a time. And it's going to end up making a T position here. And that's your final position for this Eldoa T stretch. So you can see here, taking one arm out, then the other. Now this is the position that you hold. Again, toes turned out, turn out the hands as much as possible. And you're just holding this position, breathing and smiling. For all these Eldoa stretches, goal is probably 30 seconds and minimum, but no more than a minute or two. And have, if you're coaching your athletes or you're thinking it through yourself, you want to feel some type of change or like release. And even if it's really, really subtle, this is where you have to start learning how to get in tune with your body if you're not used to something like this. But this is effectively how we gauge, have you stretched enough with something like this, is you feel some type of release, even if it's really small, if you do that over time, that's where you're going to get those big changes. So those are really a, a series that I go to a lot. They'll do A, B, and T on this. And one of the reasons this stretch didn't work that I showed you earlier is with the shoulder range of motion and mobility that we want, 
it comes from two places that people don't think about. A lot of times they just focus on the shoulder and they think about the head of the humerus there. Well, what I want to show you here is that the range of motion actually comes a, a lot from the scapula as well as the head of the humerus. So they're tied together. So if we're just focusing on the head of the humerus and you know the little rotator cuff muscles and all this stuff in terms of bands and things like that, you've probably seen on pool decks, we're missing half the picture because the scapula, if the scapula is stuck and you don't have a lot of mobility in that, it's not going to help that much because the head of the humerus and the scapula work in tandem to let your shoulder move about. So that's why something like this really isn't helping you that much because it's not helping with the scapula movement as well as the head of the humerus. Put on top of that too, we already talked about the volume of swimming, right? And the, the struggle, that forward posture, you think about being on phones or if you're at school or at your desk a lot, this is just going to exacerbate this problem of this upper cross syndrome that we call the hunched shoulders, which a lot of swimmers have as you see posture walking around. So to counteract that, we've already seen the mobility piece in terms of what we do with the shoulder. Now we need to do the strengthening side and it's about pulling exercises. So the pulling category is what you wanna do. And this is one of the most basic ones actually is a suitcase or waiter carry. There's also a farmer carry as well, but I would start with the suitcase or the waiter carry. So the suitcase carry is the athlete closer to us. Just wait by the side, just like a, carrying a suitcase and you're just walking back and forth. And you may say, well, Chris, how is that gonna help the shoulder here? Maybe I could see it on the waiter carry a little bit. So the suitcase carry is where I would start with, especially athletes that have had shoulder issues in the past, or you just need to wanna start at a more basic level is just having a weight and it could be 25, 30 pounds, somewhere in that range where you wanna be able to feel a little bit, but not so much that they're gonna not be able to stand up straight, but just walking back and forth, we're gonna slowly start to strengthen all the muscles that are required for that shoulder to stay in a good position, especially when we're moving in the water with all those strokes. A slightly higher level version of this exercise is the waiter carry. And with this one, you wanna make sure your shoulder is sunk in. You don't wanna have it stay in that up position, let it sink down into that socket. And then when you're walking, you're just trying to keep the weight as still as possible. Now on this one, when you turn, whatever arm is up or side that the arm is up, you want to keep that as the inner part of your turn. So turn around that part. That way it keeps the weight a little bit more steady as well. So it, if I turned away from it, there's a chance with centrifugal force that the weight's going to kind of swing around. So that's just a safety thing. Whenever athletes are turning, whatever arm's up, have that be the center of that turn. But again, shoulders sunk down in that waiter carry position. So that's the basics that I would start with strengthening the shoulder. Now we get a little bit more dynamic movements here. You can do something like a kneeling single arm press with a kettlebell or dumbbell. I like to feel a little bit more of a kettlebell, but if all you have is dumbbells, that's fine too. Now, there's a really easy way to make this exercise much harder and much more difficult without anything to do with the weight. And that's about how you set up in that kneeling position. So as I'm standing right here, I could have a wider stance and that's gonna make it much easier. Or I could bring into a narrow stance, that's gonna make it much more difficult. Or I could have it somewhere in the middle where it's just a little bit of challenge in the balance and having to engage the core throughout. So that's one variable you could already change this exercise that has nothing to do with weight. Once you find where you need to be or your athletes seem to be, and again, it's gonna be either a little bit wider, narrow, somewhere in the middle, then you can think about, all right, what kind of weight can we start with here? And again, it doesn't need to be a heavy weight to start with. You just wanna start having the athletes understand, how do I control this up and down in a narrow hallway with the weight not going forward or backwards or side to side? And this is where we build up the base of strength that's required to keep the shoulder safe and to counteract all the volume that a swimmer is putting their body through by just being in the sport. Another one is around the world or halo 
movement. And you can do this with a sandbag, a kettlebell, even a dumbbell. And it's basically trying to go around your head in as tight a range of motion as possible with whatever the weighted implement is. And so whatever your reps are, let's say five reps, you're going to go five directions one way and then five directions the other. So both shoulders are getting a good deal of movement, but it's also under a little bit of resistance that helps with both the strengthening and mobility. So it's kind of a two for one here on this exercise. And that's the whole point. When it comes to shoulder health for swimmers, depending on who you're working with or what your background has been with shoulder issues, it could look much more like, oh, you're doing a lot of exercises that look more like in a rehab setting, or it could be where you're pretty advanced. It looks like, man, you're just training your shoulder. But regardless of where you are on this spectrum, if it's more rehab setting or more training setting, you always need to have these two elements in terms of making sure we're increasing shoulder mobility in a safe and functional way, and then making sure we're increasing shoulder strength, again, in a safe and functional way, because it's so crucial for swimmers to have strong and mobile shoulders here. All right, so now we're going to go to the pull-up strength, and give me one second, get some water here, but the pull-up strength, this is a, a really hard thing I know for coaches in terms of sometimes you're going to have athletes that they, they can do, you know, five plus pull-ups and it's not a problem. And then you have others in your group that are not even close to pull-ups. And this is such a hard bridge to gap, especially when you're training a group of athletes. So what I'm going to do is walk you through a progression of a couple exercises that you can do. And that way you can kind of figure out, all right, what level are your swimmers at? Because it's a big gap to go from zero pull-ups to even just one pull-up. Sometimes we work with athletes for months, even year plus to get to that point where they can do their first body weight pull-up, no kipping or swinging, anything like that, and be able to do at least one or a handful of reps on that. But it's a big, it's a big chasm to cross on that. The other thing to think about too, before we get into the actual building of pull-up strength is as coaches, especially, you could probably understand some frustration of, man, you know, this athlete, they just don't seem to have the endurance at the end of their race, or maybe the power, especially off the blocks or, you know, when they're pull last 50 of like a 200 fly, even though you start to get a little bit more of endurance blend into that. But regardless, strength is the underlying element that may be your missing piece if you're saying to yourself, man, I just wish they had a little bit more endurance or a little bit more power. If you've been on any of the webinars before, you've probably seen this slide. It's so fundamental to how we think about dryland at surge strength is that we want to make sure there's movement first, good movement, and then build strength on top of that. And from there, we can start to expand on power or endurance traits based on races and distances, specialties, things like that. But strength is really can be your missing piece when you're thinking about endurance or power lacking. And as I already said before, pull-up is the best example of what an athlete's strength to mass ratio is, is how many pull-ups can they do? It's pretty simple with that. Here's something to think about too, and your athletes may be aware of this, maybe not, is there's a huge difference when you're doing a pull-up and you're thinking about that engaged core, that kayak position that we talked about earlier, or just doing your pull-ups and your body's just hanging, flopping around. It's the same thing in the water too. Are the athletes just thinking about driving their arms and yeah, maybe they're kicking their legs, but are they forgetting about what's in the middle here? Pull-up capacity as they're improving, getting more and more reps, they're going to ingrain themselves to also think about how do I engage my core? And that's going to in turn help them in the water as well. So don't just focus on how many reps they're doing. Focus on how you're doing the pull-ups. Are you thinking about engaging your core while you're going up and down there? Or even if you're just hanging. The other thing too is way back at the start when we talked about core training, it directly translates. So if you have an athlete that's weaker in the core, I must guarantee you they're going to be weak at pull-ups or not able to do any. But in the same way, if they improve their ability in bracing, be able to hold it from 10 seconds to 20 to then 50 seconds on, 10 seconds off, that kind of progression, their pull-up progression or ability in the pull-ups is also going to automatically improve because they're so tied together. So this is the most basic way or one of the most basic exercises to start. And you're barely going to see movement here. So make sure you're, you're looking for it. It's this active passive hang. So your athlete's just going to hang there. 
And if you think about back to the waiter carry, it's kind of the same movement. We want to get the shoulder up and down. And that's all we're doing, but just both at the same time. So it's going to look a little bit different than when we were doing in the waiter carry. But it's the same concept of that shoulder sinking down in the socket and then coming up. So what this is giving us is the ability to work on basic grip strength and being able to move around and create more strength and function mobility around the shoulder, which is so important for the pull-up. So this is a really basic exercise, but don't skip over this because it can really hinder improvement in the long haul. Now, we can do it a pull-up by less than half the body weight of a swimmer. And so you use a TRX or other suspension system. You want to have it angled. So one, that's already going to make it a little bit easier. Then have both feet on the ground and let the athletes push through their feet as much as they need to, but as little as needed. So as much as they want, push through it, but keep encouraging them as little as needed to get up and making sure that chin gets above their hands every time. So even just working on this, this is probably about 30%, 25% in terms of what it would be 100% would be like one pull up above the bar. So this is how much less intensity an exercise like this is because of the combination of the suspension systems angled, we're allowing the athletes to push their feet and only pulling up, you know, really half or less than half of their body weight because they're able to use their legs in this as well. Now, the drop down pull up we're working the muscles that do the pull-up, but in an eccentric manner. So this athlete can obviously do a pull-up he's strong enough for it. But for the athletes that can't, have them step up on a box or have a partner help them up. So they start in this up position, right? This is the starting point. And then all we're doing is dropping down as slow and as controlled as possible. We want it to be even too. You don't want to go a lot and then go slow or go fast. You want the same speed throughout. And this is pretty difficult for your beginner athletes. They're probably not going to do more than one or two. And if they can hold it for even two or three seconds, that may be pretty good just to keep increasing reps on that for a little bit. So this is a pretty, this is where it starts to get pretty intense in terms of the pull-up training, especially if you have athletes that can't do any pull-ups, this is going to be pretty challenging. They may be on this for a while and that's okay, but this is how we can build the strength specifically in one of the prime movers, that lat muscle, this is working at eccentrically. So the muscle is slowly having to release. And that's why this time under tension concept is what we're focusing on here. How slow and even can they drop it down? Now we're moving even closer to pull-ups now. So now you get something like a super band. So not the, the mini bands, obviously the big band. And you can either put your foot in there or there's also a version where you can put your knee in as well. Doesn't really make a difference one version or the next. What's important is when the athletes are doing this, they're not swinging back and forth, going up as a narrow hallway as possible, getting the chin fully above the bar on every rep. Don't half rep any of these. Make sure chin is fully above the bar. Even if you could get chest to the bar, that would be even better. But what I found over the years is, especially with this, if you could get the one inch band or so, and if an athlete can do three sets of 10 reps on this with good form, not swinging a lot, chin all the way above the bar on every rep, they are really, really close, if not already able to do at least one body weight pull-up. So that can kind of be a goal that you work towards with your athletes. And then eventually your whole group or team may be able to do multiple body weight pull-ups. So that is the goal. Every swimmer can, we have yet to find an athlete that we have not been able to coach and be able to do a pull-up takes time. Sometimes it takes longer than others, but consistency and frequency, kind of going back to what we talked about earlier with the core training and having frequency being so important. It's the same thing with pull-ups too. Even just doing a few reps before, after practice, whether it's a drop down rep or just the active hang one, any of these, and just the frequency is so important on this. Now you can really get in some fun. Once you get athletes that are pretty good at pull-ups can do it. I would say at least double digit pull-ups for doing an exercise like this is a prerequisite. So now this is more in the speed part or like the taper part of your season. You can play around with this. So what we're doing with this athlete is she's trying to do as many pull-ups. You can see we have a super band there to help her. So again, this is like percentages of her body weight that she's doing here, probably 30 or so percent. 
and we're timing it to see how quickly she can go up and down. And we're trying to get as close as possible to her sprint freestyle stroke rate. So this is where you can start to really integrate what you're doing on land in the water, but you need prerequisite of strength. So this would not be a good exercise to work with your athletes that can't do any pull-ups. Because if we go back to that pyramid example, an athlete that can't do any pull-ups, they have no base of strength. So we can't build power off of no base. So you need to have that base of strength to then start to be able to do exercises and setups like this. And this is this particular thing, you can really do some fun stuff with this and take advantage of what's called post-activation potential. So the idea behind this is, especially at so many pools, you have pull-up bars that can be in the wall. And so what I like to do is have a combination of a wet, dry session where you're doing some pull-ups, you're activating the lat at a much higher level than you could ever do in the water. Then you jump in the water. Now that muscle's really lit up from just a few pull-ups. You're not trying to max out the swimmer, just a few pull-ups to get some fired up in the muscles. Then go like a sprint 25 or a breakout 15 meters, something like that. And creating a circuit like that, the athletes are really going to start to feel, oh, that's how I can fully engage my lat into my pull. And you can really have some cool experiences. And again, transferring, that's what at the end of the day, right? We want the dry land to transfer into the water and see that. And this is a great concept to use. But again, if your athletes have no pull up ability, this is going to be really hard. So that goes back to, taking time, being patient, build up their ability. And even if something like this is a year away with your group, it's going to be worth it to start now with that. So we've gone through a bunch here. The three big buckets you want to focus on with dry land training, high strength to mass ratio exhibited in a pull-up. You want to keep working on a strong core, building the athletes from that rubber raft to more like a kayak and making sure we increase shoulder mobility, but also shoulder strength as well to fight against the volume that every swimmer is going against. And at the end of the day, all your dry land training should be able to be boiled down into, are you able to put your athletes in better positions in the water, thinking about catch, and are you giving them the ability to hold tension longer and at higher rates so they can come home stronger in their races. So I hope you guys enjoyed going through these three dry land essentials that I think you should make sure you evaluate your program. A lot of you probably already think into the fall, what are you going to do now? Make sure these three are always included in what you're doing in dry land. So I'm going to take another drink of water. While I do, I would love for you to put in the chat anything that really popped out to you today for my presentation. What did you learn or any maybe reminder moments too are good. So I'm going to give you guys a minute to go ahead and do that in the chat. Appreciate your participation and I'll be back in one second. All right, let's see what you guys are saying here. All right, what are you guys learning? Put in the chat here for me. Are you guys not able to chat? I'm not seeing chats here. Is there something wrong with how I set this up? I'm seeing people trying to raise their hands. Oh, if I mess this up, guys, I'm sorry about that. I'm trying to see on my settings. Oh, there we go. <laughs> sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Something must have clicked in Zoom. All right. So now let's jump, throw in there. What'd you learn today? Sorry about that. Good old Zoom. They're probably changing something I missed. All right, importance of slow drop down pull ups. Oh, Cynthia has been using those Eldoa. That's awesome. Shannon, like the shoulder stretches and mobility. Awesome. Sorry about the chat function not working, guys. <laughs> yes, frequency over duration chain. That's a big one to make sure. I know, especially coaches think of, oh, well, if I don't have 30 minutes, I shouldn't do it at all. And 10 minutes can really be all you need sometimes. 
Yeah, core's huge for swimmers. All right, great. Any others, guys? Yeah, try try the Eldoa one. Yeah, shoulder mobility. Yes, agreed 100%, Paul, in terms of avoiding shoulder injury begins slow. And that's why I say, take your time on it. It's okay if it takes a couple seasons, even a few years to go through all of it. Barbara says, son has had incredible endurance. He could do about 40,000 per week easily, but he does have ooh, some, but he does not have much power for very long. Do you think just Oh yeah, a hundred percent. That would help, Barbara. All right, guys, we're definitely gonna have a Q and A at the end. I got a few more slides I want to go through, and then we'll we'll go the full Q and A. So let me jump back into it. You guys can still keep dropping in questions in there. I'll get to it in a second. So, what I want you to think about from here now going is anything new that you learned or reminded of. Make sure you're actually putting it into action. That's the only way it's gonna actually help you with dryland. So from this point, you could. Choose to do nothing. Hope you don't do that. You could go out alone or use the resources at Surge Strength that we've provided, beginning, if you haven't, with the free academy courses, the Dryland 101s. We have a ton of people in our online Dryland programs. I know I'm already seeing a few familiar faces. I saw Bernie in there. You know, he's been with us for years now. And then John's also starting a program soon. So already we got people on this webinar that are already in our Dryland programs. This is a great time to join. If you saw, we did a podcast with Maddie a few months ago where she was almost ready to quit swimming. And then she worked with us for about a year, got her first futures cut. And now she's super excited about swimming. And then just last week, we released another podcast with Landry here. She's a senior going into college, University of Houston. And she feels so prepared with her dry land now going into her freshman year, helped her get cuts and at a level of recruiting and performance that she wanted in terms of the colleges that she ended up picking. So that's awesome. And then I know Bernie already saw you in here. And then Ernie, goal, they were doing 72 pull-ups on their 72nd birthday. Goals are in their 90s, going for master's records. Love working with guys like that. So everywhere in between, we're working with even teams. So coaches, if you're looking for a team program, we do that too. So if you're interested at all, this is the time of year where a lot of you are thinking about, all right, over the next month or so, getting a dryland program into place, check out surgestrength.com in the program section. There's just a quick form to fill out and then you can schedule a free call with me and we can talk more about it. Especially if you're looking for team programs, there can be some nuances and details that we'll need to talk through to figure out if it's the right fit. So definitely fill out a form. And if you're an individual, fill out the quick form and we'll get you going as quick as possible here. So with the Surge Strength Academy, I mentioned we're putting a lot of new stuff in. So these are three dry land plans. And so they're courses that take less than an hour to go through. They give you a quick, just applicable workouts whether it's core training, shoulder health, so that's both the mobility and the strength part, and then also pull-up progressions. We just released that, the pull-up strength one. But I'm excited to announce, though, is we're going to be putting all of these together. So you can see here what the core training involves, how to test your core strength, how to then get better training at it based on what level you are, multiple routines, equipment options. Same thing with shoulder health. So we have mobility exercises, that you can test your shoulder mobility, strength, and then programs on how to improve it. And then pull-up strength as well. Assessments, progressions are so huge, having different tracks and making sure, even if you're slower to adapt to pull-ups too, we made sure we had tracks for that. But we're putting all of these, get video access to all the libraries, all my coaching, we're putting all these together into one, we're calling it our Dryland Essentials Dryland Plan. And I'm actually going to put this in the chat here, hold on one second. And this is, so this two guys is at a discounted price right now with all three of the bundles. So that includes, go back, so it's the core training, shoulder health and pull-up strength. So all three of these, dryland plans in one bundle. And so if you're interested, check it out. Who is it not for? I'll save you some time. If you're just still 
figuring out this dryland thing, go to the free courses, what the one ones in the academy. Don't worry about buying anything yet if you're still kicking it around. At least enroll in our 101s before you start looking at other stuff. Also, if you're thinking about magic guys, we would be charging a lot more than what we do. We show you how to put in the processes in place, the plans, and then how to work them. And over time, the frequency is all about the frequency. Get in, get it done, but we make sure the energy is going in the right direction. And I doubt this applies to any of you, especially if you're joining us live, that you're here to learn and guys, the same stuff that I've learned over the 15 plus years I've been doing this from the elites, the elites chasing gold medals and world records to the kids that are just trying to get their first futures or sectional cuts. It's the same process, even what we did with Cullen to get him a gold medal and on that crazy world record relay with Jason Lezak there. Or someone like Mark Gangloff, who won multiple gold medals as well, and now is doing a great job building up the program at UNC. I learned so much from working with those guys that we're now putting it into even the programs working with someone like Maddie, who's trying to get her first futures cut, or Ernie and Bernie, who are just trying to live life, enjoy swimming, and still feeling good as they get fast too. So all these things, so many tracks you could choose, whether it's a personalized custom dry land program from us, whether you're an individual or a team, or check out all that we offer in the Academy from the free 101s to the individual dryland plans, or like the dryland essentials bundle that we're just rolling out today. And we got some exciting announcements next week for if you want to be surge strength dryland certified. So sure, be sure to tune in for that. And now we can open back up to the Q&A. So any questions you guys got, I'll go back to where I left off again. Do, do, do. Uh, Robbie, so interesting question there in terms of the rapid pull-up exercise and VO2. So it, it it's not quite correlated because the, the pull-ups and how we're doing it, that's very much a, a power thing in such a shorter amount of time. And with VO2 max, you're probably going to, or for accurate VO2 max testing, you really need the, the hose in every setup because you're taking measurements of what is the carbon dioxide and oxygen ratios and how the athlete is processing that as they're going through it. So slightly different, but I could see how you were kind of thinking about those. In general though, I really like that exercise. And we actually figured that out when we were training Cullen and the other elite guys going into those Beijing Olympics is we really found a strong correlation with Cullen in particular. We would, we would do the power band pull-ups right after he would do one or two pull-up reps with 80 pounds around his waist. So if we go back to the post-activation potential, what we were setting up is we were trying to ignite as many muscle fibers as possible when he was doing pull-ups with 80 pounds. And we'd only want one or two reps. We just didn't want to tire him out completely, just wanted to fire it up. Then we would ditch the weights, jump on the band, and it would be for six seconds or less, I think. Maybe we did 10, but six to 10, somewhere in there. And then his stroke rate was 0.9, low 0.9s. So that's what we were looking for really fast. And talk about just the power that I could see athletes exhibit. It's really something crazy, but it's all about that base layer of strength. So this is not a routine I would suggest for, you know, your freshman, sophomore, uh, high school swimmer that's just getting into dryland. This is years and years of what you can start to do as the dryland program and possibilities open up. But you got to focus on the basics first for this. All right, you guys are putting a lot of questions. I'll try to catch up here. You got about 11 more minutes. So drop in any questions that you got. All right, Barbara again. I plan on continuing with the training I'm doing now, but adding your core training. Yeah, Barbara, awesome. And that's how we, I tried to, Every time I did the dry land plans, whether it was the core training, the shoulder one, or the pull-up strength, I wanted to draw a line where on the one hand, if this is all you're doing, it's going to help you. But on the other hand, too, if you wanted to supplement. So if you're already doing your own thing and you just knew, hey, I need some help with core or I need some help with pull-ups or I need some help with my shoulders, you could add that in pretty easily. And again, the dry land plans are designed for you to be able to watch it, get through it in an hour or so. You get a one page PDF printout with all the workouts, exercises. So it's really kind of quick hits. And even if you're SSDC, it's going to help you apply what I taught you through all those lessons. So it's really applicable to anyone, these dry land plans. Just uh, quick and get it into work. All right, William. Time on and off can be used in all core strength circuits as a team from beginning of the year right through race preparation. Absolutely. 
And it just takes, it just takes some organization and forethought before, right? When, when we're talking about coaches, like you just have to think about, all right, if I just have these three levels or whatever the levels you need, take a little time to plan it out ahead of time. And it makes for a much better session. Shane, what was the part about a free call with you? Yeah. So if you're interested in the dryland programs, so that would be, if you just go to Ritter or uh, surgestrength.com and the program section, fill out a quick form, just get some general information on your background goals, things like that. And then on the call, we'll talk through what's the process, how we onboard you and just make sure we're right fit too. We don't take on everybody. We are taking on a lot of individuals and teams lately, but yeah, we want to make sure it's the right fit for you. So just go to surgestrength.com programs, the middle section of that page, and there's a quick form to fill out. All right. Diallo, what's the best way to apply PAP set for set, each strength set followed by a power set or one strength exercise, complete all sets, then followed by one power exercise, all sets. What about completing all strength exercise then ending with power finishers? Would that count too? Great question, Diallo. So this goes into the programming or periodization aspect. And at Surge Strength, we try to keep it very simple. So three main phases, a strength phase, a strength power phase, and a power phase. So Diallo, what, I'm, what I've been talking about with this post-activation potential and the other examples, it's really actually in the strength power phase that I'm talking about. And it's one of my more favorite phases to program. And I think athletes really enjoy it too. The whole point is you're supersetting exercises that are the same movement category and a strength exercise immediately followed by a power exercise, rest, and then repeat. The reason you want to set it up that way. So again, going back to the example in terms of a heavy lat or a heavy uh, pull-up with weights for one or two reps, just enough to fire up the muscles, then you quickly go to a power exercise. Now, fatigue is what you want to have as little as possible, but you're going back from a power or strength to power, no rest, but then you want a lot of rest, like two to three, even five minutes before you do the set again. And if you don't, you're not going to be able to get the power on the back end. So that's why I actually would not do all your strength exercises and then finish with power because the athlete isn't going to have the power that is needed to really get the most out of that. So that's why we superset it like that, but then give a lot of rest in between. But that's the whole point of the strength power phase in particular. All right, guys, keep the questions coming. This is awesome. Uh, Barbara, is the bundle package repeat of the 101 packages I just purchased? No. So the one-on-ones are the free courses, the dryland one-on-ones. Those are just free starter ones for you guys to figure out, you know, what surge strength is about, how we approach dryland training, the dryland plans and the dryland essential bundle. These are all less than hour long courses to get through. And you get a PDF one page workouts, exercises, progressions to follow that you can start applying today. So that's the difference. The one-on-ones, the free kind of starter course to see more about dryland and our approach, and then the actual dryland plans and this new bundle I talked about today, that is actually giving you real workouts uh, to do. All right, Gregory, once again, can these be done by my eight and under swimmers, 10 under swimmers? Yes, so it's applicable, Gregory. There's a little bit different approach that we think about when it's uh, just 12 and unders in general. So we're not focusing on numbers per se, like how many pull-ups can they do or push-ups. I want more to have as expanded movement literacy as possible. So what I mean by that, can they skip forward, backward, sidewards? Can they jump? Can they hop on one leg? Um, can they bear crawl backwards, forwards, all of those things? So the 12 and unders is a slightly different approach in terms of uh, much more variety in the movement, but the concepts are still the same. And two, there's a maturity issue too, where sometimes it's better to hold off on some of these more regimented things until they're just a little bit older, but there is some, some blend as well. If you're interested on that, the SSDC really does cover that where I give you a good idea of 12 and under difference versus more your 13 age group, senior college kids. Um, but the, the principle is they, they definitely cross over. Um, William, we let the team design the on, on enough time to music. Oh yeah, that's great with the music. Whenever you can incorporate music into dryland, I think that's just so much better. Hannah, how would you set a program for masters who did no dryland before? How often intensity? Great question, especially with master swimmers. 
recovery is so important. And Bernie, if you're still on there, I know you know what I'm talking about in terms of as athletes age, they need more recovery. And so there's a couple different ways to do this with masters. It kind of depends how old are you, what's your current swimming regimen, and then we figure out what's the best thing. In general, though, if you're doing dry land two times a week, and I'm talking about sessions like 30 minutes to 60 minutes, that's pretty much going to keep you the same. You really want to try to find a way to get three in, and that's going to see some regular improvement. The variable is more with master swimmers. Where do you put those three? How do you stack it with your swimming? And then how long are those three sessions too? Because you want to get the most bang for your buck. But that's absolutely what we do, Hannah, all the time with our customized dry land programs is figure out all those variables for you. Diallo. Yeah, strength power phase is one of my favorites too. Yes. No, we don't have um, NSCA CEUs uh, for these. And uh, actually, the SSDC doesn't either. The NSCA has kind of changed their um, approach in the last few years, and it's made it uh, a lot more difficult, let's say, to get uh, verified for CEUs. Hey, Todd. So monthly, I think you're probably doing uh, the mentorship, which we had a, a call earlier. And then, yeah, so the, the mentorship is the monthly thing you're probably paying for in the academy. So that's the online or the office hours that I do on a regular basis. We just did one this morning. And then you can always comment in there too if you got other questions. Barbara, is this PAP before meet like a power up? Oh, yes, Barbara, exactly. This is perfect. This is perfect. So this is actually one of the things that with Cullen in particular, we had amazing in-season results to them. He basically did a five to 10 minute workout where we basically were doing these um, post-activation potential strength power phases, but really like small volume. And then he went out 10, 20 minutes later and did his best 50 free in-season time untapered. Uh, and that really set him up well for trials. And at that point, it was a few weeks later. But yeah, I love this kind of stuff for meet warmups, or even if you're doing race simulated sets in practice, like on a Saturday or something like that, to set them up with some dryland before can really help them break through some plateaus there. So awesome. Guys, thanks so much for all the questions. This is awesome. I hope to see you next time. I'm not sure when we'll have our next webinar, but it'll be soon. And uh, you'll get notified via being on our email list, or we'll put out some swim sim articles, but thanks again, everyone. And I'll see you next time.